Color Guard, present colors. At this time, I'd like to invite up Pastor George to give our opening prayer. I'd first of all like to thank the veterans for asking me to participate and, and do the opening prayer. I am not a veteran, but I'm a proud American, and I'm very, very proud of the veterans that we have in our congregation. So God bless you, and thank you all for your service. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you this morning for the beautiful day that you have given us to celebrate our most precious asset, our veterans. Father, we ask your blessing upon this day that each and every person here will leave here fulfilled and blessed, knowing that we still live in the greatest country in the world. Father, we ask you to bless our country and protect it. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor George. Mindy Lancaster, are you here? Mindy is going to lead us in our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light What so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight For the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming And the rocket's red glare The bombs bursting in air Gave proof through the night That our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave O'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you. And if everybody would please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Praise the Lord. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Order, arm. You may be seated. At this time, our bugler will be playing the songs of each of the service branches. Please stand when you hear the song for your branch and be recognized.
Thank you very much, Ken. Veterans Day is the official holiday that honors people who have served in the U.S. and Allied Armed Forces. It coincides with other holidays such as Armistice Day and Remembrance Day, which are celebrated in other parts of the world and marks the anniversary of the end of World War I. Major hostilities of World War I were formally ended at the 11th hour on the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, 105 years ago. When the armistice with Germany went into effect, the United States also originally observed Armistice Day and then evolved into the current Veterans Day holiday in 1954. At this time, I'd like to bring up Frank Smart to introduce our guests. Oh, good morning. What a beautiful day. Huh? What a great crowd. I want to tell you that we're just tickled pink to see this many people out here. Uh, first off, let me introduce some people. Uh, joining us today is Congressman Tom McClintock. Tom's office called up and said he'd like to come up here and join us. Now, this is a little bitty town, a little bitty VFW, and a little bitty crowd compared to some places he could have gone. So I feel honored that Tom chose this place to come up to. And glad to have him here. Okay. Also, I see in the audience Supervisor Darren Brandon. I don't see an eye Kirk. He said he might come, but I don't see him. That's okay. Uh, Debbie Eskew is the Tuolumne County Veterans Service Officer. She's here with us today. Uh, I'm looking around to see if there's anyone else I would recognize. Okay, uh, we have a group in the kitchen that are getting food ready. Now, the food is basically for the World War II and Korean War veterans, both 58, 47, 48 members, and any other veterans. We've got a limited amount of food, but you can go in there and visit, maybe have a cup of coffee, and say hi to the guys and the ladies. Uh, uh, at this time, I want to I want to make a few remarks before I bring uh, Tom McClain back up. I was born in May of 1940. That was a year and a half before Pearl Harbor. So I lived through World War II. I don't remember anything about it. it was, I was five years old when it was over with, but I do remember a couple of times I was scared when we had blackout uh, sirens go off, and my daddy had to go out in the, in the neighborhood and put on the old World War I doughboy hat. It was painted white and had a symbol on the front. He'd get on his bike, and he'd ride around and make sure everyone had the lights turned out. Well, that scared me. I didn't know what it was about, but it scared me. Then by the time the Korean War was over, 1954, I was 14 years old. By that time, I had developed a habit of reading newspapers and listening to the news. Wasn't much news on TV because we didn't get a TV till 1953. But I did, I was a news hound even back then. And uh, the world I grew up in, the world I grew up in was in large part due to the men and women who fought war and won World War II and the men and women who fought communist forces in Korea. First time our military had ever confronted communism head on on the battlefield. And those men, I've read World War II history, I've probably read 500 books, maybe more. The old saying is, necessity is the mother of invention. That's true. The father of invention is war. When you get in war, if you don't have something, you make it. You invent it. You create it. You put two, two spare parts together to make something work so you can do your job. So those men and women who fought that war, won it, came home to the accolades of American people, true heroes. They got busy then and took some of those applications that they had developed during the war and made them a commercial application. TVs were being studied and, and, and examined and, and, and planned on before the war. After the war, that industry really took off. And like I say, uh, eight years after the end of the war, my family had a television set, which was one of the most amazing miracles in the history. And uh, transistor radios, radar, flu vaccines, uh, the use of penicillin, uh, a lot of treatments to, to take care of burns was learned during World War II. Uh, all these things were created because these men and women were in a situation where they had to be creative, use their imagination and whatever tools and equipment they had and make something happen. They brought that, that ambition, that creativity, that drive back to America, and that's the world I grew up in because of what they had done. And, and I'll never forget that. I've always thought about that all my life, about maybe though we wouldn't have had television if it hadn't been for the World War. Uh, but that's, that's the kind of people that come out of war. Damage, yes. We all come out of the war damaged. But there's help for that, and that help is called the VA, the counseling. We've all gone through it, taking care of our issues so we can go on and be productive citizens. But how fortunate are we? How absolutely fortunate are we to be a country that has people who are creative, a strong religious background, have an un unbridled ambition, and yet 
in most part, we're a kind and gentle nation. Yeah, we have radicals everywhere. But we're basically a kind and gentle nation. And I appreciate that. So at this time, uh, I'm going to bring up Congressman Tom McClintock, represents the 5th District for since 2009, I believe, right, sir? Thank you, for thank you Frank. And, and I want to thank all of you for coming today. Uh, I, I want to begin this Veterans Day traveling back to the date that's emblazoned behind me right here, September 11th, 2001. I want you all to pause for a moment and, and ask you to remember what you felt as the sun rose that next morning. Now, I don't mean the shock or the horror or the outrage. There was something far more important when we sensed that our country was under attack and in great danger. And what I mean is the intense patriotism, the national unity, the, the sense of absolute purpose that each of us felt in the aftermath of that attack. You remember what it was like to drive down the street that day. Every house flew the American flag. Every American was determined to do whatever was necessary to confront and defeat the powers that had sponsored and encouraged and produced the attacks on our country and on our countrymen. Remember what it was like in the aftermath of that attack. There were no Republicans or Democrats in those days that followed. There were only Americans united in a common purpose with an intensity and determination that I think surprised every one of us. Now, I raise this point on this Veterans Day to remind us all that the American spirit that has preserved and protected our nation, that, that first showed itself on the Lexington Commons in 1775 and has ever continued to defend our freedoms, is just under the surface of our national discourse. It's waiting only to be summoned. This is the day we set aside to honor those among us and in whom that American spirit burns just a little brighter, whose devotion to our nation has compelled them to leave the safety of hearth and home to postpone or even forsake civilian pleasures and rewards simply because they know there are dangers out there that have not gone away and that our country needs them. We come here first to draw inspiration from the spirit and patriotism of our veterans. By honoring them, I, I think we all aspire to be just a little more like them. We come here to express our gratitude to this American band of brothers, more meaningful and, and, and more profound than any of the speeches that are given across the country on this day, is the simple presence of each of you who have come here for no other purpose than to pay honor and express gratitude to our veterans. Just 1.3 million Americans out of a population of 321 million served today in the armed forces. What that means is that just four-tenths of 1% of our population wakes up every morning with one goal in mind, to protect the other 99.6% of us. Only 7.3%, seven among every hundred of us, have ever done so. Winston Churchill's ode to the Royal Air Force rings clearly when you consider those figures. Never was so much owed by so many to so few. Well, what exactly do we owe them? Well, in the field, we owe them the full might and fury and resources of our nation. When they return, we owe it to them to assure that the time they lost, the careers that they postponed, the, the family lives they sacrificed, the wounds they sustained, all on behalf of our nation, are fully compensated as they return to civilian life. Some have come home with life-changing injuries with which uh, they will do battle every waking moment for the rest of their lives. These wounded warriors often go home to struggle nobly and often alone to do even the most basic tasks that we take for granted. In a sense, they never leave the field of combat, and they need to know that their countrymen will never forget that and will always, as Lincoln said, care for he that has borne the battle. And finally, let us also remember that our fallen veterans left behind grieving families that will never recover from their loss. Every member of these Gold Star families is a veteran too, whose enlistment never ends and whose wounds never heal. But most of all, we owe it to each of them to become more like them, to recognize how good our country is, how exceptional are its founding principles, how extraordinary is its constitution, how sacred are its symbols, and how irreplaceable it is to the highest aspirations of all human civilization. If we'll do that, whatever the trials and tribulations of the present, all will be well, and we will have honorably discharged our debt to that band of brothers who have defended our American legacy with their very lives. Thank you.
Thank you. Very nice speech. Next speaker is going to be Debbie Eskew, our Tuolumne County Veteran Service Officer, retired Air Force Colonel. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Congressman. Um, Frank asked me to come up because I have told him many stories about my father. My father was a Warrior II, Korean, and Vietnam era veteran. So he was proudly wearing his hat that had all three contingencies on them. He lived to about 102 years old. The last four years he lived at my house, which I had the honor of taking care of him, as I have the honor of taking care of the veterans of Tuolumne County. I don't like mics. <laughs> are standing behind a podium. So I'm gonna kind of walk, because that's kind of how I do things. So I'm just gonna tell you a couple little stories. Now, everybody has a story. How many of you are veterans? Okay, you all went into a service because of a reason, right? You picked the Army, the Marines, maybe because you like the song, who knows? So my brother, yeah, my brother was, um, we're coming from a family, there's three children. My brother and I went in the service. My brother was um, drafted through the Vietnam War. Now he had his master's degree, and he went up, he got his draft notice, he didn't get a deferment, and they said, well, you, you know, would you like to be an officer? He goes, well, how many years is that? Three. He goes, how many for enlisted? Two. So the Army, in their ultimate wisdom, made him a truck driver. Okay. <laughs> so as I come up, I love to travel, and I wanted to fly. I eventually got my pilot's license, so I joined the Air Force. And I was able to fly, flew all around the world, did medical engagements, um, deployed multiple times. So my dad's sitting in the house. And I said, Dad, why did you join the Navy? What dropped you to the Navy? But he goes, well, I was the old man. He was 28 years old when he joined the, the Navy. Pearl Harbor had just happened. And he was living in Portland, shipping steel to Japan. So that job went out the window. So he went to recruit. The Army had a huge line. He's going, I'm not going to wait. I didn't want to wait in the Army. He was going to join the Marines. But the Marines weren't at their desk. And the Navy had the shortest line. So he signed up. Now, he was born in 1913. He was a Depression baby. And they grew up. Um, he was from a farm, a farm family, but really never worked the farm. But they did pretty good during the Depression. They had a cow and chickens, and that's what he told me all my life. So my dad, I, then I was talking, well, why did you stay in 27 years? He goes, well, I got three meals a day, and they paid me. What more could I want? Okay. So we were pretty unique in my family because how many of you are in the Navy? We're Navy people, arms up. Okay, you normally never stay in one place, right? Your family moves, you're out at ship, you're going here, or any veteran. Well, we moved to Santa Clara when I was in first grade. And I sold our house in Santa Clara after a couple years after he passed. So he went, he got transferred to Moffitt they went to Treasure Island, went out to sea, came back to Moffat, and we stayed in the same place, which is very unusual for a veteran family. So the point of this story is, when we were, my, da my dad went out, um, he was at Guadalcanal. He was on the USS Fahrenheit. And his last ship was the Shenandoah, where he actually retired off of that. And I said, well, what, why did you retire after 27 years? Why didn't you stay on? He goes, because when the captain called me to do something, I couldn't hear him. Now, I brought my dad home at 98 years old. He came to live with me. He had one hearing aid. I was working in Nevada, driving from, from here to Nevada, then the next week down to Santa Clara. And I would have to interpret for him because he wouldn't wear his bloody hearing aid. And I said, why do you only have one hearing aid? Well, the Navy only gave me one, and that's all I thought I needed. Now, he got out in the early 70s, and we're talking, he's 98 years old. He still has that same hearing aid. He never went to the VA. He never did anything like that. So it was the first year my dad was living with me. This will be my last story. Is we're sitting around my table. I have my brother from Washington. He lives up there with his um, wife. So he's down. My sister's in Manteca with her husband. So we're sitting around. We're celebrating my dad's 98th birthday. His, his 99th and his 100th were big parties. But this was, he had just gotten to my house. So we're sitting around and I thought, well, my dad was um, a woodworker in the Navy. He made beautiful stuff. He could do anything. You give electrical, welding, woodwork, he could do it all. He built houses, he did all of that. So he had made some frames, some circular frames, and there was a picture of my brother and my sister, so I made copies, and there's a picture of all three of us together when we were young. So while we're celebrating my, my dad's birthday, I gave gifts to my brother and my sister, and that's where these pictures came from. So my dad looks at my brother and goes, you know, Rodney, I know you probably have thought about my, my brother's probably 
in the 70s. Um, you, this has probably bothered you all your life it, because my brother was almost two years old before my dad came home from World War II. So he goes, you probably are wondering how you got conceived. And my brother looked at my dad going, now my brother looks exactly like my father. And he goes, you oh, know, dad, I never even thought about it. <laughs> well, our ship got torpedoed and I went to Pearl Harbor. Your mom was working in the aircraft factory. My mom and my nana were actually the, Ro the rosy riveters that you hear about. My aunt worked in the, she couldn't get dirty. She worked in the office and that's where she met her husband. But so he had, his ship got torpedoed. He went to Pearl Harbor, he contacted my mother and I guess the aircraft company would not let her go on a leave or a leave of absence. So she quit. So my dad sailed into Alameda where they did repairs. So they were there a month or two and lo and behold, she got pregnant. So of course, my, you know, my, my brother never said, okay, you were two, because when my brother, my dad came home from World War II for a short time, of course he's, my mom's living in Alhambra with my Nana, and my brother's sleeping in the crib in her room. So who is this man sleeping with my mother? You know, he had, my, my um, Tia Rudy was there. Now my mother is Mexican, or was Mexican, she has passed. And my dad has a French background. So my brother looks like my dad, more Italian though, skin color, like my sister, and I'm the throwback. So it's very interesting when you're talking, he never really said anything about his wartime experience, but I do remember when he came back from, it, during Vietnam, he was in Thailand for a year. So when he came back from that episode, he was a completely changed man. Now, had I known what I know then, now, I'm sure he had PTSD, because he shut down, he became very despondent and very remote in his lifestyle and for several years until after my mother passed and I was away at college, he finally, kind of opened up. But those are just little things. You, I want you to notice around you, I've been pinning American flags and poppies on our Korean and our wartime vets. Sir, I still need to get to you. And this gentleman is a World War II and a Korean vet back here. Raise your hand, right here. So we have Korean and wartime vet Zane Orr, who's 100, is out here, and he is a World War II vet. And I'm not sure, do I have any other vets that I have not pinned? World War II or Korean? Okay, you look too young, sir, I'm sorry. All right, so those are just my little things that, about my dad. Yes, so I wanna thank you too for all coming out, Congressman, and Craig Holt, who I normally, where is he? Coordinate activities with. And if you remember, we're the Veterans Service Officer, Office, we're here to support all veterans. And I wanna put a plug out for our supervisors because we just got, they approved um, the facility on Columbia Way and we're gonna house five low-income or homeless veterans, hopefully in the next year. All right, thank you very much. But, oh, I'm sorry, I, this young lady here, Mrs. Fox, she wanted me to make an announcement. For those of you, they have an Alzheimer's dementia support group that just started, November 14th at one to three at Sosieville, Sosieville Modest, uh, Methodist Church. In so we'll post this on our website so those of you that have family members or have friends that might have this terrible disease. Uh, one thing is, my, my, as I mentioned, my father was 102. I give him the six months of gestation age because he died in December, was born in June. Was sharp as a tack until the day he passed. So, yeah. So this will be on our website, the Veterans website, Veterans Service Office website. Thank you very much and enjoy your day. Thank you, Debbie. Now, at this point, we're going to have a flag folding ceremony here in a minute, but just for right now, would all World War II veterans stand up? If you're already standing, just raise your hand. Let's see how many World War II veterans we have here today. Someone help me count. Okay, I see one, two. Okay, very good. Very good. Glad to have you. Uh, now, let's have all war, Korean War veterans stand up and be recognized. There you go. There's two more veterans there. Yeah. Okay, all you guys. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we have a, did that other group ever show up, Debbie? Yeah, yeah okay, they did come, okay. Uh, it, it's good to have all of them out here. I, I, I wish we could get more out here, and I, I, I had transportation. If they needed it, I could have brought them. George Hunter, Chapter 391, Vietnam Veterans of America Color Guard will now do a flag polling ceremony. George?
flag folding ceremony represents the same principles on which our country was originally founded. The portion of the flag denoting honor is the canton of blue containing the stars representing the states our veterans served in uniform. The canton field of blue dresses from left to right and is inverted when draped as a pall on a casket of a veteran who has served our country in uniform. In the armed forces of the United States at the ceremony of retreat, the flag is lowered, folded in a triangle fold and kept under watch throughout the night as a tribute to our nation's honored dead. The next morning it is brought out and at the ceremony of Reveille run aloft as a symbol of our belief in the resurrection of the body. The first fold of our flag is a symbol of life. The second fold is a symbol of our belief in the eternal life. The third fold is made in honor and remembrance of the veteran departing our ranks who gave a portion of life for the defense of our country to attain a peace throughout the world. The fourth fold represents our weaker nature, for as American citizens trusting in God, it is to him we turn in times of peace as well as in times of war for his divine guidance. The fifth fold is a tribute to our country, for in the words of Stephen Decatur, our country in dealing with other countries, may she always be right, but it is still our country right or wrong. The sixth fold is for where our hearts lie. It is with our heart that we pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The seventh fold is a tribute to our armed forces, for it is through the armed forces that we protect our country and our flag against all our enemies, whether they be found within or without the boundaries of our republic. The eighth fold is a tribute to the one who entered into the valley of the shadow of death, that we might see the light of day and to honor mother for whom it flies on Mother's Day. The ninth fold is a tribute to womanhood, for it has been through their faith, love, loyalty, and devotion that the character of the characters of the men and women who have made this country great have been molded. The tenth fold is a tribute to father, for he too has given his sons and daughters for the defense of our country since they were first born. The eleventh fold in the eyes of a Hebrew citizen represents the lower portion of the seal of King David and King Solomon and glorifies in their eyes the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The twelfth fold in the eyes of a Christian citizen represents an emblem of eternity and glorifies in their eyes God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. When the flag is completely folded, the stars are uppermost, reminding us of our national motto, In God We Trust. After the flag is completely folded and tucked in, it takes on the appearance of a cocked hat, ever reminding us of the soldiers who served under General George Washington and the sailors and Marines who served under Captain John Paul Jones, who were followed by their comrades and shipmates in the armed forces of the United States, preserving for us the rights, privileges, and freedoms we enjoy today. This number two folding was done for all the veterans we have lost, regardless of war, so that we can live in the freedom we have today. Thank you, Chapter 391. It's a side note, Chapter 391. Myself and five other Vietnam veterans started that group a little over 35 years ago. Still going strong, got a few more years to go. I could make another speech about the crisis of veterans affairs in this county, but that's for another time. Uh, at this time, VFW Post 4748 will now deliver the gun salute.
Danny, come on up. Please join me. Mighty God, the hour is come and we must part. May the good providence shield us from all harm and grant that in life's battles we may be strong and brave. We ask that you lay your protective hand on all those actively serving our country and guarding the gates of freedom and bring us together again in peace and comradeship. Amen. Thank you. Amen.